Welcome to our first webinar. This is Bernard Morton, the uh, Branch Chairman of the Northampton IWA. Neil Owen, who's the Regional Engineer South for Canal River Trust, is going to talk tonight about innovations in CRT. <clears throat> we'll bring him in in a second or two. Um, just a bit more about the branch. We um, cover the um, area of Northamptonshire, which involves the uh, part of the Grand Union, Leicester Line, the Northampton Arm, <clears throat> and the River Nen. And we also look after the Northampton Arm. We have regular task parties there twice a month. And um, we'd like to see anybody who wants to come along as a volunteer to join us. Information on our website, uh, Northampton branch website under IWA. And uh, we hold our task parties on the first Sunday and the third Tuesday of the month. It's a very active branch in terms of supporting the uh, Northampton Arm and CRT. I'm sure Neil will confirm that. Um, yeah. But enough from me. I don't want everybody uh, switching off at this stage with a uh, number of people listening for us. Uh, I'd like to introduce Neil, who's now going to take over and say a few words about innovations in CRT. Over to you, Neil. Thank you, Bernard. Um, well, as uh, Bernard's just introduced, I'm going to talk about innovation within Canal of Bridge Trust, but I'm really emphasising within asset management, which is the team I work with. As Bernard said, I'm regional engineer for the South, so um, my team cover the East Midlands region, the London Southeast region, and Wales Southwest. So we could come down the side and around the bottom of the country. And it's, we represent about a third of the assets um, based within the whole of the, um, the trust. Uh, yeah. Firstly- Neil, I'm gonna say one quick word. I forgot about the housekeeping, which I was told to mention, which is look out for your uh, Q and A um, button at the end of the session with Neil. He'll talk about questions and answers afterwards. And also there's a chat but if you're having trouble setting up, click on the chat and send a message on that. You'll get a response from uh, IWA. Sorry, Neil, over to you. <laughs> yeah, no uh, yeah, just thank you to the, the Northampton, Northampton branch, sorry, for the invitation tonight. Um, it's nice, to, it's always nice to do these things and to have so many people joining us from outside the branch. So I'm going to cover what we're doing in terms of inspections. Let's say it's all about data. So I've got a few subject areas I'm going to talk to you about. Um, Firstly, the challenge we've had with lock gates, it's quite topical. We've had some issues this year. Um, electronic inspections, which is something we've moved to in the last 12 months. Um, laser technology, laser surveys, based on our survey technology we're using, and also our hydrographic surveys and how those have changed in recent times. So in terms of lock gates, um, we own 3,105 locks, lock gates with 5,843 leaves on the system, various designs, various ages, various scales. So our repair yards capacity is about 270 leaves a year, depending on the size and complexity of the gates, but we can outsource additionals if we required. So based on that number, if we were to replace it full capacity, it would give us an average age of gate replacement about 22 years. In reality, we're tending or we're trying to get 25 years out of a gate. Some last longer, so tropical hardwoods last longer. Um, some of our dock gates, for instance, West India Dock, those lock gates there are 70 years old. And we've also got composite gates, steel timber composite, and also cast iron gates. There's two sets of cast iron gates, one on the, well, both on the Oxford Canal, one at Hill Morton, one at Claydon. But this year we've had a few issues, I think it's fair to say, and the, pictures there are a few gates that have failed in season and what we've been finding is externally when we inspect these our inspectors go along with a, a longest piece of tube they can get in their vehicles with a, a big spike on the end of it so they've got a sort of six foot long uh, pole which they dig it used to dig into the timber and we've been finding the external timber is quite good but actually some of the internal timber has rotted away from the inside and we've had a number of gate failures where, whether it's boat impact damage or gate locks being operated such that paddles are left open and gates draw closed, we don't know, or just in standard operation, they failed. We've got a temporary fix. So there's an example here of a temporary heel that we've put on steel fabrication. And to a certain extent, they're, they're common components. So. A lot of our fabricators will hold the right side tube in stock 
they'll have some pieces potentially made up, but they're bespoke for each day. Each gate is slightly different. The distance between the top rail and the underside of the balance beam is different. The position of the collar actually that connects the gate to the wall is slightly different. So we're trying to standardize elements, but it's bespoke for the lock, which means inevitably we have to get it fabricated. Um, it's quicker than new gates, but it still means the canal is closed. Um, in some instances, it's been for a couple of days. In other instances, it might have been a week or more, depending on where the lock is, whether we need to li lift the gate out to do the work or whether we can actually fit it back into the recess. But we've done a few of these and we've done a few proactively as well where we've raised concerns. But one of the issues obviously is the condition of the timber. So we've been looking at some new technology, resistor graphs have, used, have been used in the um, electricity industry to, to check electricity poles and also telecom poles to see what the condition of the internal timber is. So we've got currently got two national lock gate inspectors each one each have now got one of these and basically it's a very long thin drill press the trigger it measures the resistance to the drill and gives you a profile of the integrity of the of the timber within the heel so this will allow us to check all our eventually all our gates we're targeting at the moment so if there's any we've got concerns the um, lock gate inspectors are coming out and checking them for us and it allows us to be more proactive and to find out what condition the timber is in without being too destructive in the per, per, in the process as well so one of the things with our lock gates is you know can we innovate and some of the factors that we're looking at at the moment is appearance of the gate is critical to try. So whatever we do, we want the gates to look the same. Uh, many of our locks are listed, so we always have to replace a certain proportion on a like for like basis and match what we've got. There's possible opportunity when replacing existing composite gates. So there are already composite gates on the system, many of which were put in the 1960s. And I think it's fair to say a lot of those gates were fabricated and weren't necessarily designed. So a lot of the feedback I get from our operations teams are that the steel actually warps. So if you fit new timbers to the head and heel, the guys then try and fit the gates back in and they won't fit properly. So each time the gate comes together, it comes together in a slightly different position, which means even if they cut the mitres down, potentially when when the water's back in it won't close in the same position they get leakage and the guys hate leaving jobs when they're in a position where they've got you know the, the walk away and it's not perfect in that respect so what we've been doing certainly within the south is replacing a lot of those composite gates with timber but there is an option potentially to look at other solutions um, so we're looking at alternative materials and working methods um, and there's examples around the country of where others have done this, have innovated, not only this country, but also around the world as well, uh, different materials, different designs. We also want to extend the um, expected life of the gate. If we can double the expected life and reduce the interventions, then we aren't having to spend the whole of the winter stoppage period doing gates. So it allows us to do more relining, also allows us to do underwater works on a lot of our structures, the bridges, um, waterway walls, which we don't currently get a chance to do because compressing the amount of work we've got into the winter. So by extending the life of the gates, obviously that gives, we're not doing as much in the same period of time. They must be designed for boat impact load, not just the hydrostatic load. That's one thing we know from our pilot we've run. The design criteria for the gate is definitely boat impact. Um, if you look at a lot of commercial waterways, what you find is they actually have um, large steel or large timber bulks that come out in front of the gates. So certainly in the Netherlands, um, they've got, they, they protect their gates against um, impact. Obviously a lot larger shipping they've got there. Um, but they do that because they've got an item that's sacrificial they can replace and that protects their gates. And a gate must also be designed to allow 
repairs to the head, heel and gate seals without dewatering, ideally, which minimises the stoppage time. So a lot of the cost in our stoppages are lifting in stop planks, well, firstly fencing to protect against um, um, the fall that was created by dewatering the lot. But if we don't need to do that, then it reduces the cost, but it also reduces the time. So for instance, can, can we fit a seal to the head, which we can remove and replace in situ, even if we still need a crane, the big saving is in the, the dewatering. Um, and ideally we can get the module smaller as well. And we're also looking at different sorts of seals. So again, look talking to other um, areas, so Waterway Scotland, for instance, they don't have a continuous heel post on the gates. They have a series of thrust blocks and they seal against a very small seal, which is rebated into the coin. So there's a lot of good practice out there. And it's a question of just trying to find that and share it and see what works for each individual um, organization really. So in terms of options, I've got a few examples here. So um, the ones on the left are on the Monmouthshire and Brecon Canal on the restoration section that's um, being done by volunteers. Um, these gates are coming in a module form, so they're lifted in in pieces and then slotted together. And this allows them to fit them potentially in a dewater canal using the towpath. So they had a, they've got a very specific set of requirements, but certainly show what can be achieved. Um, Top right is an example of a pilot study we did last year, bottom set of gates at Lock 71 on the Kenneth and Avon Canal. Um, these have got larger timbers than we would have liked, but part of this was to give us flexibility in terms of fit, um, given the measurement, um, the way the gates are measured and are currently fitted. And that's identified some, some certainly some improvements we can make in terms of measurement to lay, potentially survey the locks using modern equipment beforehand, possibly even dewatered so we know exactly what we're fitting and also some issues associated with the seals. So we're trying to fit the gates to an existing seal. Would it actually be easier to fit a new seal to the gates? Then we know it's going to fit perfectly. And the bottom right is an FRP gate, which is fibre reinforced polymer. And that's actually in the Netherlands. Um, the gates are made in one piece, um, moulded, and the company that make these are very interested in doing um, some in UK. And next year they will be fitting a set on the um, Environment Agency's navigation on one of their dry docks near Sumber, I believe, which will be great because it will mean there's a set of, at the moment it's just pictures or going out to the Netherlands to see them. Once there's a set here and also in a dry dock as well, where you can actually deep water the dry dock and look at them in situ it'll be really helpful to then sort of see how they how they behave and whether they would work we're also looking at some elements of standardization so for instance um the issue big issue as i said earlier is to do with the heel posts on gates now what we've done with the um set we installed this last year was We've got a timber heel, but we've got a steel top where the gate collar comes round, and that's got a um, self-lubricating um, ring around it. Now the guys have actually greased it as well, which is strictly necessary, but it certainly it it um, does away with the issues of metal on metal binding. Um, and also the, the pot details. Now, typically, um, a lot of our canals have pots in the ground. So you, this is recessed into the ground or it's got a plate on the bottom, which bolts down. And then you, the, the bottom of the gate has a pin in it, which is hole drilled in the bottom of the gate. This is pushed in and then screwed into place. And what we find is that sometimes you get material dropping into the pot and then that can wear. Now, this particular pot is also designed so it's, it's lower at one end than the other and the reason that that's done is to allow the gate the idea is that when the it it would go against the wall with the deepest section furthest away so that as the gate pressure comes on it rides up 
when the when the water pressure comes off the gate, certainly on the bottom gate, the pin drops drops into the part and slides down away from the coin, making it easier to operate. The only thing is, from a from an installation point of view, it means the guys have got to jack the gate up to the highest point on the pot. And what you sometimes find is they're fitted the other way around because it's easier. Um, so whilst there was good thought, good reasons behind the design, that's not necessarily been translated to our installation teams. Um, but the top detail shows a arrangement where the the pin is on the ground and the pot is on the gate. And that is very common now with bridge bearings. And it's done for the reason of stopping material dropping into them. So things like, can we standardize the way the gate fits below water level? Arguably it's all replace, re, it's all reversible in the future should we wish to. Um, but it also means that you've got a standardized item that you're then not trying to adjust a module to fit at different um, different pin or pot arrangements. So, so there's a there's a discussion and thought process going on there. And one of the things we could do, uh, there's an example there of the 3D model, and you can rotate that. That one's got a cranked balance beam. It could be a straight balance beam. It's just an example. But it, we could establish a standard design, which is designed up to take to a certain depth of lock, certain width. And then it's just a case of stand of dimensioning rather than designing. So we know it's suitable. It's a bit like our stop planks. We know they're suitable up to a certain loading. Um, and that's really, if you like, an ideal scenario. There's something that with well, there's discussion in the trust at the moment about how, you know, is this the right thing to do? Are there other options? But certainly something that we're thinking about at the moment. So moving on, electronic inspections. Um, traditionally, we've done inspections on paper, produce long word documents, um, which take quite a lot of time. Typically about 20% of that time was on site and 80% was back in the office trying to sort out the pictures. Um, particularly when we used to take four digital cameras, you go out for a few days, get them developed and then trying to work out which, which locks which. It's always a bit of a challenge. You end up going through the, no, going through the negatives and actually matching the negatives up so you, you can see them in chronological order. Um, but what we're trying to do is maximise the work we can do on site now. And we're even, the applications we're using now use voice recognition. I'm told by one of my colleagues that accents aren't an issue that it learns so as people are using it more it becomes more useful on that voice recognition um, we can add photographs on site and we can annotate them on site so we can be looking at a defect with a picture marking it up on the on the application so we know exactly what we're talking about um, we're also using existing equipment so all our smartphones that the trust issue us anyway, the applications will run on those. And our asset inspectors use iPads. And again, the applications will run on those. So one of the issues is having the right piece of software. Um, so we're using Survey123, which is an Esri product. Esri are the company that supplies with our GOS software. So it's all compatible. And also because it's a Esri product, we've got guarantees that the, it will be sustainable because we we have used apps in the past, and the thing is, an app developer can decide actually we're not going to we're going to switch that off and change it to something else. So if we spent time developing it, we want to know that we've got that continuity of the development. So just a screenshot of the some of the apps when we go in, we pick the pick the particular form we want, and that gives us some options. So we're targeting the information we want people to collect. Some of it self-populating. Um, there's a series of drop downs that allow guide people and also radar buttons so people can just click the right answer. And this information collects, it collects data which feeds into our asset models. So we're developing a series of asset models which, monitor, which allow us to model degradation. So whilst this inspection could be done this year, what does that mean in 10 years time? If the next inspection potentially on some structures could be 20 or more years, then actually what's gonna happen in that intervening time and how those structures are gonna behave. To allow us to do longer 
forward plans. At the moment, we work on a three to three year window. This could move us to a 10 year, well, we're moving to a 10 year now, but this will give us a more informed 10 year plan um, based on some assumptions, but consistent assumptions through the modeling exercise we're doing. And each one of these forms is bespoke to the structure we're looking at. So this one's this example here is a lock inspection. So the question is, what do we actually need? Because in the past, we've done inspect, we talk to people about what do we, why do we do a principal inspection? Why is it formed out like that? It's a certain amount of industry standard. Certainly with bridges, we can look at what network rail are doing. We can look at what local authorities are doing in terms of their bridge dock. But we have some unique structures as well. So what's the appropriate interval for a lock, for instance? What's the appropriate interval for culvert? Again, culverts, there are some similarities with other organisations. So the asset strategies ultimately will drive data requirements because the, the, the strategy will say, I need this piece of information. So when we're going out and doing an inspection, we're collecting those specific pieces of information based on the frequencies that we agree is appropriate. And in terms of cost in B17, and it's a little bit out of date now, but we spent 1.3 million pounds against the spend of circa 40 million. Now, that's not, if you compare with other organisations, that's not horrendous, but if we can get more for our money and improve the information and improve our intelligence, then obviously we can target that expenditure more. and get the right interventions at the right time. And it's fair to say the trust can change its process within industry best practice. We can define what we want. So just because we've done it like that before doesn't mean we have to continue doing it like that. Um, so for instance, our old, because we used to produce a 10 page report with pages of photographs and records, our new electronic reports were a lot shorter, but they give us the information we need and they give it to us in a cost effective way as well. So survey technology, um, survey technology, I think it's fair to say is changing all the time. Um, GPS survey equipment, the accuracy is improving, the the size of the equipment's getting smaller. It's like all electronics, it's getting smaller and more cost effective. But what we can now do is using the equipment available, we can survey our structures with a set of controls. So we put, we'll set up some um, stand, standard surveying systems. We'll set up some control points, which we can then reference back to give us repeatability. But the actual surveys are very quick now. So most of our surveys are done in a day. They're accurate. They're using GPS positioning. Um, gives us millimeter, sub millimeter accuracy, both in terms of position and level. And they're repeatable because we set up the control initially. We've got reference points to reference back to. Once we've set those up to actually go back and do the survey is, is, is quick and it's very accurate. So we can overlay a plan from six months ago, three months ago, and compare the data sets and see how much things are moving. So because we've got repeatability, we can look at things like how much did that, is that, for instance, on a bridge, is that crack opening and closing? Well, actually, is it seasonal? Does it open in the summer and close in the winter? Or is, is, it, is it seasonal, but it's the overall trend is it's getting wider? Now, obviously, we'd do that from just measurement but on an overall structure it gives us that global um, overview of how the structure is behaving and it also gives us a really good reference set of data so for instance when I was talking earlier about lock gates once we've done it we've got that data forever now if we're concerned about movement we can go back in but equally we could say once we've got the information we can use that in the future so some examples here, this is on the Oxford Canal at Lower Hayford. We had a, reta a retaining wall on one of our bridges, which was listed. And we had a discussion with the conservation officer about the listed building consent. And traditionally what we'd have done was 
um, produced a drawing, um, which we would then agree based on the drawing, what we're going to do, submit a listed building consent application. Those applications can take between six and eight weeks. Um, and then we'd agree, that would agree the work we can do. Now, in this instance, what we discussed, well, if we were to get a laser survey, which actually identified the individual stones, we could then basically mark that plan up with the conservation officer, with the heritage advisor, and agree what we're going to do. And then the construction team would work to those plans and we could do another record after the works were finished. So this is the plan we generated, but what we also did was had an overlay, photographic overlay on top of the survey. So this is, these photographs are to scale. If you just look back, you can see the voids. And what we did was annotated this plan on site and the conservation officer said, that's fine, don't need listed building consent. If that's what you're gonna do, obviously it varies from conservation office to conservation office, but they had the confidence that actually, yes, that information is enough for me to allow to do the works. And what we did was on completion, we did another survey and that's a record set. Um, now with this, because we got to the level of detail that we got individual stones, it did take longer for the, the the CAD teams from the from the survey contractors to actually digitize each of the stones once they got the data in, but it certainly paid for itself. Another example here um, of a bridge that we've been monitoring on the Grand Union Canal. And this is just a point cloud data. What we asked them to do was set us up a grid and then to contour that grid. And we're talking about how do we deal with the arch because we knew we got a movement on the arch and we're talking to the contractors and what they suggested, well, actually, if we laser scan underneath the arch, what we can do is we can lay that flat in 2D, but actually contour it. So the plan in the bottom right is a contour plan of the underside of the arch. And what we were able to do is repeat that survey over a period of two years. And we were able to confirm that there was no ongoing movement at that point. Now, because we've got the data set, as I say, we can go, if we are concerned in the future, we can go back and take another survey and overlay it. But this pictorial representation was really helpful in us understanding the behavior of the structure. And to be able to present it in this way also makes it very easy for us to see the information when it's presenting as, as the traditionally what we'd have done was we've got a spreadsheet and they'd have given us each one of those points with with the data in terms of position level etc and you you can then look at that data set and compare it from set to set to see if it's what the changes are but actually better see it in one sheet was was really, really helpful. The, the, the raw data is still needed when we come to do the work to actually identify how much, you know, how deep is that crack, how, how much brickwork have we got to replace. But this allows us to really quickly and easily see what's happening. So we moved that on to look at some locks. Um, lock width is, a, is potentially one of the big issues at the moment. Um, particularly on narrow locks. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest challenges is, is to agree what the width should be, but certainly in terms of measuring it, um, this is actually lock nine on the Napton flight. And we know we traditionally we'd had issues with boats um, getting caught, getting stuck, and it was getting worse. Uh, we're getting more reports. So what we did over a period of 18, well, two years actually, is we took a set of surveys and we set the control up on the first survey. And then what we'd do is the surveyors would come in, do it in the summer, in, well, in the summer months. Um, they get there about half past five, six in the morning. The local ops team would drop the pound off so the lock was as, as, as empty as we could get it. And 
they would do the survey work and the canal would be refilled by about 10 o'clock in the morning. So with a short restriction, we could get in and get the data. And we got, uh, we're doing it on a three monthly basis. I think we got about eight sets of data over the two years. We could see the movement was ongoing. We could see if there were some elements of seasonal variation. But by rendering this image with the yellow to red showing that the, the width of the lot to be narrower. So what we did was we set up a center line down the center of the lot relative to the, to the approaches um, and then measured off that center line to tell us whether we got more or less than the width we'd expect. Um, as I say, one of the challenges agreeing what that width is, um, we used the Frankel report to give us that information, part of the Transport Act uh, data. Um, and what we actually did was we refaced the lower, this is the toe part sideboard, the lower one. And on the off side, the bottom end you can see was narrower. And it was also, there's this sort of narrowing below water level as you approach the invert. So what we've done is we've rebuilt the tow path sideboard to give us a little bit more space to avoid us having to reface the whole of the lower section of the wall. But we did some local refacing at the bottom of the um, chamber here. So by doing this, we were able to target what we were, sorry, were able to target the areas we're working on and also give us the confidence that the data was correct and that we were doing the right, we were you know, effectively doing the right areas. So we also had cross sections set up and we did have a tabulated set of data. So in addition to those, those images, we also had the, the base data as well and we could see how much they were moving. So that allowed us to pitch up, pick up, yes, there was seasonal variation. So it was, there was, as the material behind contract in the summer it moved back a little bit the wall was actually moving backs and forwards a little which again is another cause of concern to us um, so using the data we could easily identify the issues we had identified that seasonal movement but we also identified the narrowing and it allowed us to target our design to preserve as much of that original fabric as we could um, it was rebuilt using matching brick and we actually didn't have the copings um, available when we finished the work but so we put concrete blocks on there which has now been replaced with uh, some nice brick proper brick copings and this was the first boat to come through after we opened and one of the boats that historically had had problems getting in and went through without any any problems at all we were very grateful to say so my final area I was going to talk about today, hydrographic surveys. Um, our hydrographic survey team work nationally and they are increasingly collecting more and more data for us. Traditionally, they used to collect the survey information to drive our dredging program. And there's an example here of us. This is the smaller of the boats they've got, uh, which is easier to launch and transport working in relatively shallow waters and there's an example there of the output so the blue areas are deeper than minimum the minimum open channel standard and the red green through to yellow to red indicates the shallow as it shallows up and the data is continuously monitored so traditionally before we got this we'd have done 25 meter cross sections and they would have probed across the canal with the staff. So they've got soft bed and hard bed. So they drive through the soft bed to get to the hard bed, which gives you a volume calculation. This picks up the, the bed profile. But with that same piece of kit, what we've actually done is turn the sensor sideways and we've done a survey of Islington Tunnel. Now, bearing in mind this system works on GPS to know where it is, it's not designed to work in a tunnel. So what our survey team actually did was set up a GPS unit with clear sight and measured back to the boat. 
so they could reference the position of the boat relative to a known point as they move through. And it's the first time the equipment had been used in this way, and the manufacturer actually came out to see them when they were doing this um, and helped us establish the principle of how it worked. But what we've done here is we've produced a image below water level of the of the tunnel wall and it's allowed us to see where the voids are understand the position there's there's a lot of data behind that image as well which we can we can look at individually but it took three days for the survey team to do it the alternative option was to put two fabric dams in dewater the tunnel pump the tunnel out and then go in there and manually survey it the price for us to put the put the dams in pump with a pump and the spec was £70,000 and this took, we there's a little bit of modification to the boat um, and then the time to do the works and time to process it, a fraction of the cost. Um, and we've also proved the principle so we can now do this elsewhere. We've also done some dock walls except elsewhere as part of this project actually. We took the opportunity to look at um, some other issues we got whilst the boat was in the area. So it's a really, really powerful bit of um, technology. Giving some examples here of the sort of data we're now able to create from the survey information. Um, again, traditionally, we'd have just got cross sections and you can see on the drawings here where the cross sections would be. And we still do generate those cross sections and that, that data is contained within our um, GIS mapping system. So we can go in there, click on it and it shows us the profile and also shows us the compliance to our minimum, our minimum open channel standard. But this, again, visually, you can see where the chain with the color coding quickly pick up where there's issues. So, for instance, in the top left corner, you can see here there's not very much blue and green. So that would suggest shallower, you've got a nice section of blue, but you can see it, 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 it's changing as you work, work our way along. And where the canal widens, as you'd expect, it's deeper in the middle channel where the boats go through, but the sides, it's shallowing out. So it's, a, again, a really quick way of us identifying where the issues are, being able to put an approximate volume on it, because from the cross sections, we can look at those, work out how much material we need to take out, to give us a volumetric calculation and then we can work out how many meters cube of material we need to take out what the likely cost of that is whether we take it to tip or whether we can dispose of it locally um, so it gives us a lot more information when we're planning our dredging program and we've been looking at some new technologies as well um, everything's getting smaller um, this is a multi-beam, remote control, multi-beam echo sounding boat. GPS positioning, so it knows where it is spatially at any one time. And for things like our reservoirs or our feeders, for the reservoir, you can actually program the boat to work its way around the reservoir. To a certain extent, you can leave it there to get on with it. Um, <laughs> price tag of £50,000, you're not probably not going to leave it alone to do it, but certainly you don't have to intervene. You can you can leave it to run up and down. It's a live data feed. So in the bottom picture, you can see the information coming back. And if there's an anomaly, you can, you can do a bit, you can spend a bit more time, slow the system down and get a bit more, you know, in terms of accuracy, improve the accuracy of the information that's coming back. But as you'd expect, some of this technology is, is not cheap at the moment, certainly it's relatively new. So craft of this type is about £50,000. So we're, we're looking at it at the moment. So, um, this was done as a demo, but certainly we can see the benefits. Um, our small boat could do the same thing, um, but this is obviously much easier to get to some locations. Some of our reservoirs are relatively remote. Uh, you can take this in a wheelbarrow and just drop it in. Um, one member of staff can do that, whereas the boat, you're going to need additional help to launch. If you've got somebody out in a boat, you also need a second person with them at all times. So this does have benefits, and it's also, in terms of speed um, to do a piece of work, it, it 
it has that benefit it's potentially quicker because you are you're pre-programming it and it's doing the most efficient route to do the to undertake the survey so that was a bit a bit quicker than i thought bernard but um thank you everybody for listening and if there's any questions be happy to um take those now right hang on so, that's it and then thank you for that neil well done everybody enjoyed that excellent thank you we'll open open your eyes job <laughs> number of questions i'll go with questions in a second just to thank neil for a very interesting talk um just before we go to questions i'd like to let you know that our next webinar the northampton iwa branch is on the 12th of january which is tuesday at 7.30, when our branch member, John Pomfrey, will be talking about northern waterways and canals. John's talk is based on his own journeys he's done with his own boat. And it uh, looks pretty interesting for anybody who's done the northern stretches. It's really worth a, a listen to. I hope we can uh, persuade you to join us on that webinar. And a big thank you to the girls who are helping us in the background, Alison and uh, Helen. Hey, hey, Wendy, sorry. Very nice of you. Um, right, questions. Let's go to the questions first uh, for you, Neil. Uh, what are gate gate leaves as distinct from lock gates? So a gate leaf is in each individual item. So on a wide lock, typically you'll have two leaves top and two leaves bottom. So offside, toe part side, top and bottom. And on the narrow lock, you could have a single top gate and a double bottom gate. Or on some of the locks, you'll have a single top and bottom. So the leaf refers to that that individual item of a gate and when we say lock gates we're referring to them as sets okay. so a top or a bottom that makes sense yeah how often are lock gates inspected someone's saying that because he was stuck in alliston for 10 yeah. days recently at lock two right the they are inspected um at different intervals depending on the condition of the gate so our process dictates how frequently they're inspected from a from a detailed lock gate inspection perspective. Um, when they're in poor condition, they're done every year as grade. Um, so they're done on a one to five rating where one is new and five is less than three years or less. So once they get to five, they're inspected every year. Fours typically have got <laughs> um five at least five years life in them they're done every three years so as the gate deteriorates the inspection frequency increases but they're also looked at by our asset inspectors as well not in the same level of detail but if our asset inspectors go out and see there's a defect or see something's got worse they call an inspection um so those inspections are done either monthly or bi-monthly depending on where they are um but what we are trying to do is increase the number of lock gate inspectors we've got so we can we can get out and look at more of our gates. Um, at the moment, the guys typically are based up in Leeds. So we're looking at, certainly in my area, looking to get somebody for the south to reduce that travel time and increase the, um, okay. the efficiency in effect. All right, thanks for that, Neil. Uh, another one about um, failed paddle mechanisms. Um, is it gone? Just jumped out of the way again. Then, um, several have been out of action for more than a year, um, despite notification to CR CRT about it. Any ideas on that? Fail paddle mechanism? It will largely depend on where they are. Um, we will always make sure that um, there is. We're not in a position where we haven't got any operational paddles on any lock. What we do sometimes find is that um, with changes in components, they're not interchangeable. So you can't just take, say, a rack from one and a, and a, a drive cog from another and they'll fit. So, for example, on the Oxford Canal, we've had this where we put them together and they see they look like they fit, but when you actually start to use them, they slip. So what we tr what we'll always try and do is when we when we put new gates in we'll put new put new gate paddles in we'll also look at the ground paddles as part of the stoppage the guys also do six monthly routine maintenance so they will try when they're there if they've got components they've got spares they will they will do it whilst they're there for ones that have been out of top action for some time they obviously you can't speak on the specifics but i know examples where there's been an issue 
below water level so it's not necessarily just a paddle it might be that they need to deal with there's an issue with the paddle the paddle de-water itself it. or the rod de-water. so they need to dewater it to do it um which not gone are the days where we could just drop the pound off the guys go in there have a look and get out um we're looking at a full stoppage with fencing pumps etc so they'll tend to wait till the winter to address those sort of issues okay thanks for that now uh there's another comment about um am i right in thinking the gate mechanisms are no longer greased this means maybe mechanisms of hybrid operate well i know for a fact on the arm they're regularly greased as they are on the gu and everywhere i've been um which includes uh, the arm itself this year and other areas it's been greased in fact so much so i'm very careful crossing the uh, the gates themselves say get on my shorts <laughs> yeah, that is part of our plan preventative maintenance they are done uh, normally twice a year um they're greased and there's a there's a specified grease for different um different paddle gearing um okay. different units yeah, thank you for that another interesting one this time hi all we have aspirations of ground paddles driving cheap turbines possibly pumps just in reverse to then back pump water back up to your above top gates has this been explored it's an interesting one isn't it um i can't say that particular option has been looked at and we have looked at pocket hydro schemes um on lock bypasses feed valves um certainly there's more hydro schemes going in now on um our rivers, navigable rivers like the Trent. Um, but in terms of local back pumps, um, one of the issue in terms of the actual way the paddles, you've got a paddle culvert obviously with a paddle above it. So um, I'm not sure the logistics of the head, the pump would be driving against how efficient they would be. Um, but certainly we've got various back pumping schemes as people are no doubt aware of. Um, but I can't say that's something we've, we've ever looked at, but certainly, yeah, just interesting it makes you stop and think. <laughs> it does, because you've got a lot of pressure from the top of a flight, which could be used to uh, do just that, and then feed the uh, power to the pump at the bottom to shove it back up again, which makes a lot of sense to me, yeah. Um, interesting one again, this is a complimentary one, really. Some years ago, BW undertook a series of overnight stoppages in season and promoted to exchange top gates. The uh, thinking behind it being one night overnight stoppages, say from 4 p.m. to 8 a.m., took the pressure off the winter program without too much inconvenience to summer boating. Why has this idea not been rolled out further? Just a thought. We have been looking at this. Um, okay, that's good. I know the West Midlands team um, have, for the last few years, been replacing gates throughout the summer. Mm-hmm. So where they've got... Um, parallel arms where they're able to maintain a through route Mm -hmm. they have been working through the summer um i know personally i've been involved in overnight stoppages in the past um uh, on the grand union canal radford calcutt section and those because they're 1930s locks everything's fairly plumb Mm -hmm. so you can cut the collars take the gates out put the new gates in fit the seal to the gate so you can pre-cut the mitres, they come together and you just put a seal liner in very, very quick. You can't do that on every lot because of the angles, different angles of the walls that you have to cut the mitres down. That takes longer to do. Um, but what we have been looking at is doing short stoppages through the summer to do relining on gates. So where we've got leakage, um, for instance, I know in London and South East, talking to the local teams, um, we've got a programme for next year where, where we'll be looking at going in for on a we agree with the trade which is the most convenient day in terms of the, where we've got boats coming out and coming back but we go in say on a tuesday lunchtime shut tuesday lunchtime work tuesday afternoon into the wednesday reopen on the thursday so we've, we've got two days but over a three-day period okay. um and by doing that we can get those stoppages done season earlier than they would otherwise do and also free up more time in the winter to do the gate replacements because one of the issues with doing so many gate replacements is there's less time to do relines okay thanks for that another one about recyclable material such as reclaimed plastic would a reused plastic composite gate work well frp they don't like you using the word plastic because it's a polymer but effectively it is a plastic um one of the concerns that our ecologists have got is to do with microplastics so with any plastic it's you know is it going to deteriorate with boat impact but Very if true. you look around the system 
there's an awful lot of um, historically we used a lot of recycled plastic fendering. Mm -hmm. So for people that know Tesco's in Warwick, there's a the, the canal um, was was widened. The bridge was was extended when the when the shop was built to create a, a turn in lane. Mm -hmm. And there there are very large plastic fenders and some of those where the boats have hit them have actually chunks have broken off so i think a lot of it is to do with material selection but there's there are rubber fenders that work very well but we tend to use timber in because it's um renewable but certainly in terms of gates i think the jewelry is out at the moment there's a lot of materials that are being tested and it's like it's like technology you know, when we look at the surveying equipment's come on so much in the last few years, the same is happening with materials. So I was talking to one of the fabricators we worked on with the steel gates, and he was basically saying, well, steel will be a thing of, it won't, be, you know, when you look at the whole life costing and you start to look at the sustainability of FRP as a material, you, you might well find that actually taking into consideration manufacturing costs, recycling, how long the gates last, the materials that go into them, actually the FRP could be the way forward. But there's a lot of a lot of research, I think, to be done yet in terms of bottoming out what the right materials are and also um, looking at them in terms of their whole life cost and their whole life sustainability as well. Okay, thanks for that, Neil. Uh, another one about leaky, quite a few about leaky double gates here. <laughs> where, are we on, where are we on technology to seal bottom gates, mainly worn by single boats, they're getting double locks with a single yeah. uh, gate open. Isn't there anything out there that can be fixed to worn sections and expand when in water? It obviously needs to be very secure and not to be scraped off by boats exiting the lock. Yes, one of the problems is as soon as you put something that stands proud, it's as you pointed out, you know, it's the, yeah, the boats true. can clip it. Um, we've tried using different materials. So we know from experience that our Eki gates do not wear in the same way mm -hmm. as a set of um, oak gates do. Mm -hmm. And we've also looked at, can we put a steel strip insert into the gate, which protects that edge of the gate? Um, the other thing we're doing is when we're fitting liners, the guys quite often now will put them in in sections. Mm -hmm. So typically the wear is at and just, just above and below water level. Mm -hmm. So if they put this, put the, on the bottom gates, if they put, put it in two pieces, it makes it easier to replace. But we are also looking at rubber materials um, and you know we're, we're it's a it's a real issue for us um because of the water loss so we're continually trying to find solutions but what we find is anything that's that's not securely fixed does have a habit of getting caught now we've looked at hydro you say about expanding contact with water that you can get packers that sit behind them that expand and we have looked at that but typically once the line is in it will seal anyway. So that's not so much of an issue. It's more the wear on the front face. Okay. And we can get FSC, so um, environmentally accredited Eki timber. Now, I've challenged that myself in that Eki is grown in a rainforest, but the, the um, suppliers are confirmed is those are the trees that are used for thinnings mm -hmm. to allow the other timber to grow. So you can understand how that could be more sustainable um but there are a number of timber species we could use traditionally we use oak so looking at harder timbers could be one of the solutions okay well thanks for that uh, what exactly is minimum open water standard it's minimum open channel standard so that's the chat that's the standard we use to determine whether or not the canals are um no. meeting the dredging standard so we have a box which varies in size depending on the navigation it's in mm -hmm. and within the cross section if that box fits that's compliant then there's a stand depending on how much silt there is in it it's non-compliant so i think it's a 90 percent compliance okay. so if 90 percent of those boxes fit it's compliant if they don't it's not compliant that's and the, the, the more that fail the, the, the worse the compliance okay that's straightforward enough, isn't it um, how do you investigate movement of the water around a lock in and out of as the lock is filled and emptied and leaks from my from by by words including ground movement? Uh, in terms of 
it's not something we tend that, really. no. It's not something we can really... Ma we, we have done tests to determine how much locks leak. So, for instance, um, colleagues from our water management team have done what they call a stilling test. Mm -hmm. So, with no water movement, they can measure the upstream pound, they can measure the level within the lock, they can measure the downstream pound, and that gives us an idea of flow. Mm -hmm. um, not something we do routinely, um, but it is something we have done where we where we've got a particular issue or where we're looking at water yeah. transfers and things of that type. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, innovation, recycling, what are you doing to increase the waste recycling bins around the cuts? an interesting one. Um, well, I know because I was on the London South East uh, user forum last week, mm -hmm. that certainly within London South East and within the contract, there is the introduction of more recycling. And yeah. I believe the, the contract's out of, or it's, it has recently or is, is soon to be retended and recycling is one of the elements um i think with everything one of the challenges for the teams are that the recycling doesn't get abused because if it is then um that creates problems in itself it, you only need a small amount of the wrong material and the whole batch is is, is, is ruined um but i know it's it's not something i deal with directly but i know it is something that's been looked at as part of the new contract and more recycling bins are going in and also compacting bins mm. so solar compactors to increase the volume we can get through yeah it's important because i mean i certainly been on trips where i've got we end, end up for some strange reason stacking up loads of beer bottles and wine bottles <laughs> and getting nowhere to put them you know and it's uh until we find a suitable place to dump them up. They just stack inside the kitchen, but that's the way it goes. Um, thank you for that, that's good. You mentioned using standardized parts of the lock gates, but but we're discussing if that was the best way to go, what other options are there? You've already mentioned that, haven't you, really? You've answered that. Yeah, I mean, one of them is to stay as we are. Um, we've got a number of different patterns that we use in different canals. Yeah. Um, I think the, the thing with, once we start thinking about, um, if we are going to move to a, a different design is whether or not we can standardize the components that are used at least on that set because then it makes we can we're not with the timber it's very easy to move things and fix things in different places if you're going to look at a different material like frp like steel um it's the way you fix those becomes more difficult and the so if we've got a stand, one of, for instance, one of the things we found was when we moved, we moved from one canal to another um, to fit the, the local um, pintle detail, we had to increase the size of the section on the bottom of the gate because the pintle didn't fit. So minor things like that actually make a big difference when you're looking at steel in terms of uh, the weight of the gate the buoyancy of the gate so you start to have to look at all those factors again um so to be able to standardize firstly makes it from an engineering point of view makes it a lot easier but also it means that we can be quicker and more um, more efficient i suppose okay I'm just conscious of the time and uh, trying to run but we've yep. got a few more questions coming through Pretty obvious one. This. Do you recognise the difference between capital spend as opposed to pure maintenance? Well, I know that anyway. Um, in other words, are you encouraged to invest in technology which will provide benefit for many years? The public sector sector often simply accounts on a cash basis, and therefore can be biased against working for long term. You you work for the long term. I always have done. Yeah, we, we certainly with our ten year plans, we're looking at capex, capex, and opex spend, okay. um, and looking at whole life costings as well. Trying to move more to net present value yeah. and whole life costings. Okay. Can you make use of many volunteers on the network or is it survey and maintenance for skilled engineers only? It's an interesting one because I know we do a lot, but we don't do, don't do those bits. Um, we've got volunteers in all sections of the organisation. Um, certainly within my team, we've had uh, graduate or Pete, we've had students working for us prior to graduation. We've had um, people working with our asset inspectors, be that helping our asset inspectors or picking up other data. We've also had um, retired engineers that have come into work work with us. Um, in fact, I was talking to one of our volunteers who's a, who's a, who was a, ret a retired engineer and actually said he quite enjoyed actually just doing the locks. He'd done that. He didn't want to do that anymore. He was quite happy working on the locks. Um, I couldn't convince him to come and help us out doing some inspections. Um, but we have had um, 
retired um, or, or you know people that have volunteered, a lot of them are uh, have recently retired, um, coming in to help us. Um, so if anybody's interested, please let us know because we're always looking for people to help us out. Okay, thanks for that. Is it possible always ways used to find out how recently a lock gate has been inspected and what can, the condition was? The answer is not really. Um, sorry, Bernard, can you say that again? Sorry, is it possible for waterway users to find out how recently a lock gate has been inspected? In other words, you don't usually leave a mark on there saying this has just been recently inspected. <laughs> no, it is recorded on our system. So if anybody is interested, we can always get that data from our system. So our asset management system does record the last inspection and, last, and the condition, um, and we'll have a copy of the report on our system. We've got a few more to go here. This is an, I can answer this one because I've been stuck this way. The rule is that both sets of gates must be closed when leaving a lock. Why is this? Well, you go through lock 17, as I did one morning, when someone left the front gates, so the, as, as I left, it had been open, and it had drained the whole flight, uh, a whole section of that flight, and I got stuck. It didn't get any further than about 100 yards after that. In other words, you've got double insurance. If you close both sets of gates, if the bottom set leak, the top set stops the leak continuing. Would you agree with that? Yes, yeah, it's always, I mean, some, there's, there's different practices on different waterways, but yeah. certainly um, in the south, we've always asked for people to shut both sets of I gates. Think, I think it's a canal thing anyway, because I know on the River Nen, for instance, with the mitre gates there, if, as you are leaving, you leave those gates open. Different kettle of fish there on a river as opposed to the canals. And as I say, I had direct experience, so I know it's uh, not a good idea to uh, leave those gates open. We've had a few people guilty of that on the Northampton Arm. It does cause problems. It's better insurance at the end of the day. Um, are there any new methods of dealing with leaky brickwork within locks? Piddle, as he's put down. Oh, I know what he means. He means the ones that pour out. Again, I've had direct experience, but it's poured out through an open hatch out into the engine room, which is not a good idea, you know, as the, uh, the gates drain, as the, as the lock flows down. Yes, there are. Um, we, depending on the structure, depending on where we are, um, we have used polyurethane grout. So for instance, on Northampton Arm at Lock 14, um, we used to have a bit of a pond on the downstream end of the gate, um, okay. the lock. And part of that was flow through the waterway wall. So what we've done there is injected at the back of the wall, um, a hydrophilic grout, which is expands in contact with water. So it's an instant expansion. It doesn't sort of continually expanding, but so if you've got a flow, they put a high expansion grout in to stop the flow and then they'll grout around that and it just forms a modulus with the material it's going into, but it's impermeable. Um, with, with, with the sort of leaks between the, what, if you've got a, a situation where the, the chamber drains and the leak stops, it's normally because there's a void. The best way to do that is to point out and seal that gap. Because ultimately, if that's left to continue, you're going to get a situation where if water gets trapped in there, it'll expand and contract, and that will blow the facing of the brickwork off. The fact it's actually released in some places is a good thing, but um, certainly sort of fill it, grouting that either with a, with a lime grout, which you can also use um, just, as a, just as a void filler, and then pointing out the face. Okay. Well, we've got a program for doing grouting work nationally. Mm -hmm. um, every year we spend about three quarters of a million pounds on... I've seen, on the arm. I've seen actually on which is good. Yeah. I think he used it on one occasion. I simply remember people from Milton Keynes uh, Building College who turned up and helped out as well. I seem to remember that, yeah. which is pretty good. Good reuse. Quick, very straightforward one. It's a silly question, but 3D printing has come a long way, suggesting do you use 3D printing technology? I think we haven't, but it is something, as you say, is coming on all the time. It is. Um, so I can see us using it in the future. All right, one more question. And we're, we're done, I think. Well done. That's right. Let it overrun beyond half. Uh, sorry about that, girls. We've got uh, Alison Stenner. We've got uh, Wendy Humphreys and Gemma Bolton in the background taking care of the running of this, which I uh, thank you all for your help on this one. Uh, rural accommodation bridges are often looking neglected and regularly damaged. A local bridge 60 on the G of severe movement cracks and a weight restriction was applied for many years ago. The weight limit can convenience the local farmer and has incoc on costs. What do you mean by incoc? impact on cost, I guess. What's the likelihood of repairing, strengthening those bridges? Each one's um, individual merits. Um, the trust got a liability, got a um, liability which is based on traffic of the day at the time the canal was constructed, mm -hmm. which is typically a horse and cart, typically three, three tons. Um, what we find is obviously as agricultural kit gets bigger and bigger and bigger, um, 
you get an increased load on the bridges. Now, some of them, the actual arches themselves, will take four ton, 40 ton Arctic vehicles without any problem. What we're increasingly finding is it's the fill, in, fill within the abutments that moves. So the arch is okay, but the, the abutments sort of almost peel yeah, away. I see it. I see it. Yeah. Um, yeah. We do have regular conversations with landowners. There are examples of where um, landowners have contributed to increase loading on bridges. Um, but each, to be honest, each one is, is, has to be looked at on its own individual merits, what the, what the um, custom and practice of use of the bridge is. Mm -hmm. But it's something that our inspectors do keep a close look at. Um, mm -hmm. We've got some, some of the bridges um, I can think of that don't look very you know, they, they are cracked, but they're yeah. stable. And Milton Keynes, I know them for facts, yeah. yeah. yeah well, Milton Keynes is a good example, actually, because it's from clays. Mm -hmm. And with these changes in weather patterns, we found that bridges in Milton Keynes that have been stable for 200 years mm -hmm. have started to move more in the last 10 years. So there is a very, you know, th th there is a variation in uh, weather conditions, also ground, um, surrounding ground use where levels have changed, which has impacted on how much surcharge there is on the ground. Um, I know it's, it can be a number a of factors. Yeah, yeah I, I, can, I know that one at, at our end on, on, on the bridges there, the Arctic hit it all the time and damage the brickwork, you know what I'm talking about. It's perpetually a problem, that one. Yeah, which is why we put Triaf curbs in on that one. We that's, actually that's right. that's we right. actually narrowed the bridge down to try and pull the vehicles away. And touch wood, I think, it's not it had so many good. issues since no, then. Not well. that, not that. One last one, that's it, guys. I've been noticing a lot of mortar loss in brickwork at or below water levels under bridges. Do you address this issue regularly when you obviously inspect them, don't you? Yeah, one of the challenges is obviously getting in there to do it. Um, so what we what we have done recently um we've targeted a few bridges so mm -hmm. certainly milton Keynes, we, we um looking at a program trying to do one or two a year where we de water get in there and point them um i know we've done one on the leicester section this year and on the oxford canal we've been doing the low water level repairs again one bridge a year on our lift bridges so it's an ongoing issue one of the challenges is the right materials um depending on the brickwork that's used, whether we can use lime or um, a cement mortar. If we're using lime, we've got to allow it enough time to cure before we put the water in, because otherwise it'll wash back out. So it's getting the timing right, getting the materials right and protecting it correctly. Um, but there is a challenge. As I said earlier, one of, the, one of the things is because we're doing more lock gates, it's less time for our teams in the winter to do things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly it's something we're aware of. You always get that sort of um, damage in the in the water freeboard level. So where the water level fluctuates, you're always going to get the erosion at that point. Where it's always underwater, it's not an issue. It's the it's the freeze thaw layer where the water level fluctuates that's always the challenge. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's been a very interesting presentation. It's one of the seniors you. I want to thank you on behalf of the IDWA in Northampton and the, and the uh, attendees and the... Uh, Participants, uh, they've had. A, I've seen some very complimentary messages about how nice the presentation has been. He really is impressed. People are impressed with it, and the webinars in general help out the IWA. Head office has been um, monitoring this for us, and thank you again for the girls doing that. And thank you very much, Neil, for doing it. And okay. At this point, I shall wrap up the uh, evening for everybody, and I wish you all a very good evening, and hopefully see you at the 12th of January at uh, 7:30 for John Pomfrey's uh, presentation. I hope you'll join us then as well, Neil. Thank okay. you. All right, take care.